All right, good afternoon. Um, just a few things at the top and then happy to take your questions. This morning, Secretary Austin departed for Ramstein Air Base in Germany to host the 24th meeting of the Ukraine Defense Contact Group, which convenes tomorrow, September 6th. At Ramstein, Secretary Austin and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General C.Q. Brown, will bring together ministers of defense and senior military officials from some 50 nations to ensure that Ukraine has what it needs to defend its people from Russian aggression. Some key focus areas of this UDCG will include bolstering Ukraine's air defense capabilities, updates on the UDCG's capability coalitions to include the Air Force Coalition, and the energizing of the defense industrial bases of coalition nations to enable support to Ukraine for the long haul. As Secretary Austin has said, Ukraine matters to U.S. and international security, and the efforts of the UDCG continue to play a vital role in Ukraine's fight for freedom and their sovereignty. Turning to our humanitarian efforts in Gaza, the MV Cape Trinity completed its offload of approximately 6 million pounds of humanitarian aid in Ashdod. Over the next couple days, the Cape Trinity will prepare for its trip back to the port of Beaumont in Texas. The 6 million pounds of aid delivered this week brings the total aid delivered to the people of Gaza through the maritime and air corridors to more than 38 million pounds. This effort represents the highest volume of humanitarian assistance the U.S. military has ever delivered in the Middle East. Switching gears, yesterday, Secretary Austin spoke by phone to his Philippine counterpart, Secretary of National Defense, Teodoro. The two leaders discussed U.S.-Philippine defense ties following the productive U.S.-Philippines 2 plus 2 ministerial dialogue in July. Secretary Austin also reaffirmed the ironclad commi U.S. commitment to the Philippines following recent dangerous and escalatory actions by the People's Republic of China against lawful Philippine maritime operations in the South China Sea. Both officials discussed the importance of preserving the rights of all nations to fly, sail, and operate safely and responsibly wherever international law allows. And a readout of the call um, has been posted to Defense.gov. And finally, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the recent and untimely passing of Tom Scutieri, a former member of the Pentagon Press Corps family and a dedicated journalist. Press colleagues will remember him for his birthday wishes, breakfast and lunchtime morsels, and press briefing bingo. On behalf of the Department of Defense and OSD Public Affairs, I'd like to extend our deepest condolences to his family and his two children, his friends, his press colleagues, and his loved ones. And with that, I'd be happy to take your questions. I believe we have AP joining us via phone, so I'll start with uh, Lita Baldor. AP. Thanks, Sabrina. Um, question on Secretary Del Toro. Uh, the Office of Special Counsel has found that he violated the Hatch Act. Uh, does the Secretary or do I have a comment on that, particularly since the Secretary has often talked about uh, U.S., uh, about how troops should not be get involved in politics? And then uh, secondly, uh, do you have an update on the sailor that's been detained in Venezuela? Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Lita. I'll take your, I'll, I'll take um, uh, the, your first questions first. Um, so uh, in terms of the Office of Special Counsel report that you just referenced, um, we just were made aware of the report. So it's currently being reviewed. Um, but what I can say on this issue, um, or, or broadly speaking, is um, earlier this year, uh, Deputy Secretary Hicks signed out a memo um, that was sent to senior leadership in the department. Um, and it stressed the importance of complying with federal law and DOD policy that addresses um, participation when it comes to the political process um, by DOD military and civilian personnel. Um, and in the memo, you know, it, it talks about the the right and and uh, the the right to exercise our right to vote and participate in government. But it also highlights that as public servants, we uphold DOD's longstanding tradition of remaining apolitical as we carry out our responsibilities. Um, and so, just to emphasize on that. Um, you know, it's it's important that we maintain the trust and confidence of the American people, uh, which requires us to avoid any action that could imply um, the support of any political party uh, candidate or campaign. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Um, in terms of uh, your second question um, on the U.S. sailor in Venezuela, I, 
I don't have more other than to confirm that um, a U.S. sailor was detained in Venezuela um, around August 30th by um, Venezuelan enforcement authorities while on personal travel. Um, the U.S. Navy is looking into this. We're working with the State Department, but at this time, I just don't have more for you. Um, all right, I'll come back in the room here. Idris. Um, do you have an update on how many forces are currently in the Middle East? I know there's 40,000 or so. Yeah. Um, and just following on to that, how long do you think you can uh, keep the additional squadron that was sent there um, sort of in an efficient and sustainable manner? Is that something you just plan on having there for the foreseeable future, or is there a end date sort of thing? So in terms of the uh, actual numbers, I don't have more to provide than the 40,000 that I think we had provided um, maybe a, a week or two ago. Um, in terms of any force posture movements, I don't have anything to announce at this time. But as you know, and, and as a general writer, I think briefed a few weeks ago, the, the TR was extended. Um, eventually, you know, as we do with all carriers or um, rotations, there will be, uh, you know, she will eventually leave the AOR. Um, but nothing to announce at this time. There's still two carriers that remain in the um, Central Command area of responsibility. And of course, we have um, the ARGMU in the Eastern Med along with you know, a company of destroyers as well. And um, just switching topics, sure. uh, the, um, the the ship that's on fire um, that was attacked by the yeah. Houthis, is there any plan for the U.S. military to help salvage it, uh, given that I know you've talked about sort of the potential environmental disaster if the oil that it's carrying um, starts leaking? So my understanding is that um, the, you're, and you're referring to the MV So Union, that's still on fire. So for an update, she still sits completely immobilized within the Red Sea, um, still posing uh, an environmental, uh, potentially catastrophic environmental disaster and a navigational hazard. Um, she still remains on fire. Um, my understanding is that um, the company of the So Union has contracted tugboats to go out there and to um, conduct, you know, fire operations and to try and salvage the vessel itself. Um, those efforts have not been successful, mainly because of the security environment. The Houthis continue to fire um, you know, missiles, drones towards shipping in the Red Sea, um, and they have threatened tugboats that went out for salvage opportunities. They have threatened them, um, so they did have to turn away. So right now, the ship still remains on fire. There have been no recovery um, successful attempts yet um the u.s you know navy is is standing by to assist but right now i'm i'm told that um this is being done through private means janie thank you sabrina two questions sure. on uh, ukraine and south korea okay uh, ukraine president Zelensky said that uh, if the united states authorized the use of long-range missiles ukraine could easily defeat russia so why is the United States reluctant to allow Ukraine to use long-range weapons? So thanks, Janie, for the question. Um, our intelligence assesses that 90% um, of Russian aircraft launching the glide bombs and the firing missiles against Ukraine um, are at airfields that are 300 kilometers away from Ukrainian controlled territory. Um, so these airfields now puts that out of ATACM's range. Um, so ATACM's would not be able to reach these airfields. So therefore, the challenges posed by these glide bombs, um, you know, would still remain. Um, and even if Ukraine, you know, were to use ATACM's against the very small percentage that of the airfields that remain in range. We've seen Russian the the Russian military move those airfields back. So again, uh, the impact would be very little and a very little strategic value. And you had another question? Yeah, thank mm -hmm. you. And does the United States still want South Korea to provide additional weapons, including 155 millimeter artillery set? I think we've been very clear with uh, all partners and allies all around the world willing and able to provide military assistance to Ukraine, including 155 millimeter rounds that we know they desperately need um, to, to help uh, Ukraine in their fight. Um, I won't speak for other nations and what they're providing, um, but as I mentioned at the top, uh, you know, there is a UDCG tomorrow. 
Um, air defense is one of the many topics that is going to come up at that UDCG. Uh, we know a priority for Ukraine is those 155 millimeter rounds. So whatever other nations can provide uh, would certainly be welcome to Ukraine. Uh, I'm going to go to the phones and then come back in the room. Jeff Shogel, Task and Purpose. Uh, thank you. There's been a lot of information recently about Russian influence operations. I was just checking, has Kevin Costner been in the Pentagon recently? You know, Jeff, not to my knowledge. Next question goes to Carla Babb, VOA. Hey, thanks for doing this. That's a great question to follow. Um, I want to go back to Ukraine. At the current pace um, that the U.S. is providing Ukraine aid under the PDA, it looks like about $6 billion in authority is going to expire unused at the end of this month, FY 2024. Could you give us some more clarity about what's going to happen to that money after September? And is there any intention to extend that authority or to ask Congress to extend that authority so that Ukraine can continue receiving PDA packages? Thanks, Carla, for the question. So as you know, we worked very hard with Congress to secure that supplemental and to allocate that money uh, for Ukraine for these PDA packages and USAIs. Um, I don't have anything to preview on, you know, our what that means for the the rest of the amounts that are left. What I can tell you is you've seen us do this almost on a weekly va basis. We continue to roll out and announce presidential drawdown packages that vary in size, um, but we continue to do that on a consistent basis. I have no doubt that um, we are going to use everything we can that's available to us uh, to make sure that we are continuing to provide Ukraine what it needs, both in the short term and the long term. Uh, the president has said it before, the secretary has said it, and you'll hear him say it again. Uh, we're in this fight with Ukraine uh, for the long haul. We are standing with them for what they need on the battlefield, uh, both in the long and short term. So you're going to see us make use of those funds um, in any way possible. I'll take one more from the phone, and then I'm happy to come back in the room. Uh, Heather, USNI. Uh, thanks so much. Um, with the Houthis in the in the Red Sea, um, are, are you guys noticing in any kind of uptick? It seemed like they were quiet for a little bit, and then now they're attacking um, multiple tankers. Is there any um, intel, anything that you can say about what might have been causing this most recent uptick? Thanks, Heather. So we've seen this pattern sort of happen over the last few months or, or since the attack started. Uh, there is a series of waves, then they then, then there's a pause, then there are waves again. I can't speak to the strategy behind that. I can only speak to what we as the United States military are doing with our partners and allies. Um, and, and of course, you're very familiar with Operation Prosperity Guardian and the fact that we continue to ensure um, that those shipping lanes remain open to ensure that um, freedom of navigation can occur in the Red Sea. Um, but you're seeing what the Houthis are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, they've set on fire a, a oil tanker carrying 1 million barrels of crude oil. Um, I don't need to explain to you what type of damage that could cause um, to an environment like the Red Sea. Um, you know, you're talking major ecological systems that could be destroyed. Um, so while I can't speak to their tactics, I can speak to the fact that they're causing um, environmental and economical disasters right, right in their backyard. I'll leave it at that. Yeah. I think this is Sabrina. In light of Middle East tensions, does the Pentagon support a United Nations-led military peacekeeping force in Gaza, West Bank, and throughout Israel, and have a follow-up? So I don't have anything for you on that. Um, the president has been pretty clear that there will not be U.S. boots on the ground in Gaza. But in terms of, um, you know, the ceasefire deal, uh, that's something that the United States is working very closely on um, with our partners and allies in the region. That would include some type of, you know, uh, peacekeeping force, but I don't anticipate that that would include U.S. military boots on the ground. Well, in light of Hamas using the mm -hmm. Philadelphia Corridor in Gaza to smuggle in weapons and potentially smuggle out uh, Israeli hostages into the Sinai, Sinai Desert, it's according to Israel Prime Minister Netanyahu, what is the uh, Pentagon's perspective on the strategic military significance of the Philadelphia Corridor? I think you just mentioned some of the strategic significance of the Philadelphia corridor, but I'd really refer you to the Israelis to speak to that. Um, you know, we know that there are, are tunnels in, under that corridor, but 
ultimately what we want to see here is um, a ceasefire deal put into place that allows um, hostages to come home to their families. It's almost been a year now. Um, but I'd refer you to the Israelis to speak more to the significance of that. Fadi. You know, um, that knowledge of the existence of tunnels underneath Philadelphia mm -hmm. corridor, the Egyptians deny the existence of these tunnels. Can you share more about what you know about these tunnels? I don't have more to provide other than what, you know, is, is I, I mean, I'm not going to be able to do it, unfortunately, an intel assessment from here. Um, I would say, broadly speaking, we know that there are tunnels on that border um, and in that corridor that have allowed in the past, um, you know, a movement of weapons shipments into Gaza. Um, again, what we want to see and what we are focused on, as, as you know, um, is bringing home and making sure that we can get into place um, a ceasefire deal that also allows the hostages to return home. What is what does uh, you said broadly? Is this based on recent intelligence or Israeli? Uh, I don't know sharing information. Yeah, I, I wish I could get into more specifics. I just won't be able to get into that from here. But um, I'm just gonna have to leave it at that. I'm not asking about the, the, the type of intelligence. Yeah. But when you make such a claim that there are tunnels underneath the Philadelphia corridor while Egypt is denying that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think um, some explanation is warranted here. Appreciate the question, Fadi, but I'm just not going to have more. I'd have to refer you to the Egyptians and the Israelis to speak more to that. Um, what I can tell you is what we've seen in the past, um, but I'm just not going to be able to, to get into any more details from here. Can you define that? When was the last time you... Yeah, I'm just, unfortunately, Fadi, I know this is not going to be a satisfactory answer for you. I'm just not going to be able to provide more specifics. Yeah, Matt. Thanks, Sabrina. Going back to American restrictions on Ukraine's sure. weapon usage, um, you say that the prime targets inside Russia are outside the range of ATACMs. Yeah. Um, so then what's the purpose of these restrictions being in place? Is this to, you know, protect the Ukrainians from themselves, from you think they would otherwise squander, you know, their limited ATACMs? Um, or is it a fear of escalation? Or can you explain what the thinking is there? Yeah, you know, Matt, I think it's a, it's, it's a little bit of all of those things. Um, I think the, the Ukrainians, in terms of, you know, their own decision making, they are, they have proven themselves on the battlefield just from at the very beginning of the war. I think, you know, there were many people reporting at the time that, you know, Kiev was destined to fall within days. And then, you know, it was weeks later, months later, and now we're talking many years into this war, we've seen the prowess of the Ukrainian military on the battlefield. So they, they certainly know how to make their own decisions when it comes to um, employing these types of weapons and munitions on the battlefield. There is a limited number of ATACMs. Um, it is not, there. there is not an abundance of these long range type of, of uh, capabilities. Um, and of course, one thing that we're always assessing is, is escalation. And that's something that we've been very clear about from the beginning. Um, so it's a bit of all of those things knitted together. Um, but they have been very successful in using these ATACMs to take back their territory in the South and the East. Um, and we believe that they have the capabilities and being able to knit those together on the battlefield, um, you know, they do have a, a, a really significant challenge in the East. And um, being able to direct some of the firepower that they have that direction is um, what we continue to work with them on. Will the idea of loosening restrictions possibly come up in tomorrow's contact group talks? I can't predict the future. Um, <laughs> Um, I'm sure, you know, th uh, there's been a lot of conversations about that, but right now there's no change to U.S. policy. Thank you. Yeah. Noah. I'm sorry if I missed this, but the posture changes from Russia to move its assets for glide bombs beyond the 300-kilometer range, was that made after May when the initial restrictions were loosened for Ukraine from the U.S.? When did that occur? I don't know when they started moving that, um, but we, I, all I can tell you is that we know that there have been airfields um, uh, positioned outside of the, the ATACMS range. And then secondarily on uh, the delivery of the last six million pounds of aid, does that then mean that the remaining JLOTS personnel who are there in the region will now be heading directly home or are they still waiting on other parts of the mission? Uh, to my knowledge, the only remaining part and component of the JLOTS was that Cape Trinity, so they will be heading home. Um, I'm not tracking that there are any other uh, remaining parts or pieces uh, you know, associated with JLOTS or personnel, I should say, associated with JLOTS still left in the region. Yeah, yes, in the back. 
thank you very much sabrina on uh, 2nd of september two uh, us uh, security personnel were attacked by a group of 15 people in izmir turkey uh, those people were belong to a uh, nationalist uh, party of turkey how concerning is this for the united states such exposure of us military person personals to uh, such kind of uh, nationalist group in terms of security of the us security persons abroad so i i don't have much more to add than to what general ryder spoke to earlier this week um you know i i think it should tremendous professionalism um on on the part of our marines that that were attacked there um you know, we fully support the local police looking into this incident. Um, I believe the Naval Criminal Investigative Services are also cooperating with lo local authorities on this incident. Um, so we're happy that everyone is safe, that everyone um, is back on on that um, mu, um, on the argmu. But ag again, I just don't have more to add as it's an ongoing investigation with local authorities. Great. Yes, in the back. A quick question on. Uh first uh, Armenian American military drills that were held recently in Armenia Eagle Partner 2024 I was wondering if you have any comments on these drills and in a more broader context about the current stage of military cooperation with the country of Armenia or the perspectives I'm sorry I don't I'm, I'm not aware of the drill so I I don't have anything to offer on this one Constantine uh, I, I would refer you to the COCOM I just don't have anything more to add Constantine thanks Sabrina um, Going back to the sailor in Venezuela, um, just uh, so the last time mm -hmm. a U.S. service member was sort of detained or connected with Venezuela was Jordan Goudreau, who was a special forces operator looking to basically lead a small coup. Um, are there any concerns that this is this sailor being detained as part of something more significant, deeper? I. I not going to speculate, but I, I don't think so. Um, that being said, you know, I have very little details um, as this sailor was on personal travel to Venezuela. Um, this wasn't something that was authorized. And as you know, um, the State Department recommends against traveling there. Um, so, you know, the, the U.S. Navy working closely with the State Department, I have very little details um, on this incident. Um, of course, we'd like to see the sailor returned home. But again, I'd refer you to the State Department for any for any further questions. And of course, don't want to go down the rabbit hole of speculating. Yeah. Yes, we'll go in this room. Yeah, um, I have um, a question about if you can talk a little bit more about the presence of the um, US militaries. Um, off the coast of Israel, you know, the two ships and the, the still if the submarine is still there. And um, if you can talk a little bit more about the presence of the military and if um, there is some sort of coordination with some European forces to support the US in case of escalation. And then I have a second question about Ukraine. Okay. Um, so nothing has changed in our force posture uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, the USS Georgia is still in the UCOM area of responsibility. Um, we still have our destroyers. We still have um, the ARGMU that's there. Um, it's, I would say, s still sending a very strong message of deterrence in the region. And also, you know, should Israel uh, come under attack, that's what the that that force posture is there to do is to help defend Israel um, if they were to be attacked like they were on April 13th. Um, but I don't have any changes to announce for our force posture. There are some. Are you guys asking for any support from the, let's say, the Italian or Euro Southern European forces? What Middle do you mean by forces? support? Like, um, to, be po to support the American ships and, you know, like, I having, like, European militaries also in the, in the region supporting the Americans, not being only the Americans taking care of the area. We're so. always working with our partners and allies in the region. It is, uh, you know... The east, the, in the Eastern Mediterranean. So I think you would expect that there are um, countries with a naval presence um, tied to Europe that are constantly operating there. Um, you know, we, we do regular exercises with our European allies. Um, I don't have anything to read out from here, but of course we're always coordinating with them and working with them on a, on a daily basis. And my second uh, okay. question, if you can talk um, a little bit more about um, the, the traveling of the secretary in Germany mm -hmm. um, uh, about what can we expect if you can you know what's they're gonna you know you probably have some information that you can share with us about what they're planning to talk what when we expect coming out from this meeting well I'm just gonna have to 
tell you to tune in tomorrow. But um, look, I don't have more to really provide than what I read out at the top, which is that this is you know, the 24th meeting of the Ukraine Defense Contact Group. Um, we know air defenses is one of the top priorities for the Ukrainians. That's certainly something that's going to be discussed tomorrow. We know fires, so 155 millimeter rounds, also a priority for the Ukrainians. That's something that I'm sure will come up. Um, but I, you know, not going to get ahead of the secretary. But, uh, you know, I think you can expect some of those um, conversations. And then, you know, as I mentioned, um, there are eight capability coalitions that have been stood up as part of the UDCG. Um, those capability coalitions, including the Air Coalition, is one that the United States co-leads. Um, so that will be an opportunity to talk about other additional needs that the Ukrainians have. Yes. Yeah, th thank you so much, Sabrina. About the Middle East crisis, so what is the latest uh, assessments of the Pentagon regarding any potential action by Iran against uh, Israel? really don't have much more to provide than what we've said before, which is that, you know, we've maintained a very robust force posture in the region. You know, we have two carrier strike groups, um, you know, right there. Um, has that factored into Iran's decision making process? Um, I think it's got, certainly gotten into their headspace. But, um, you know, beyond that, uh, we're maintaining our force posture there. We're there uh, of course, to defend our forces, and should we need to, we will come to the defense of Israel. Great. Yes. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, it's been reported from last Wednesday some of the Arab military attaches met here in Pentagon with U.S. defense officials, uh, specifically regarding mm -hmm. the possible Iranian attack on Israel or something like that. But my question is regarding the uh, U.S. possible measures are something under consideration with your Arab allies like UAE. Qatar, where you have military presence, and Saudi Arabia as well, who is very next to Yemen, as Yemenis are like calling mobilization cars each day. So uh, you have done enough with your Saudi counterparts, uh, Qatar and UAE, on the possible Yemenis, any, any type of retaliation to counter that. So I think what you're asking is just on, if I'm understanding, and please correct me if I'm not, um, just asking about what is our response and how are we working with Arab partners in the region when it comes to the Houthis and how they're yeah. respond yeah and Yemen. Yeah. Okay. So um the the Houthis continue to disrupt shipping lanes within the Red Sea and and, and the BAM. Um that has caused environmental, economical problems. Uh that is not just a problem for the region, that it, this is a global problem. This disrupts shipping for all around the world. Um, and so when you create, to use the example of the So Union, which is carrying one million barrels of oil, if those fires spread to those oil barrels and those oil barrels start leaking into the Red Sea, you are going to have an ecological catastrophe. So just taking a broader step back, this isn't just a um, United States, you know, Arab partners problem. This is an international problem. Because um, just think about, and I'm not an environmentalist, but just think about the actual environmental, economical, financial degradation that's going to happen just from that one ship, and they're doing it almost daily. So you have to, so so it's not just an Arab partner, or it's not just an Arab country problem or a United States problem, it's a global problem, which is why the secretary um, late last year convene or um, established Operation Prosperity Guardian. And Aspides is another coalition, um, a European coalition that is also um, works with Operation Prosperity Guardian and other like-minded nations that believe in upholding the freedom of navigation. Um, so this is something that we continue to work together um, uh, with many of our allies around the world, and we're going to continue to do so. Well, the mm -hmm. uh, Department of Justice and Department of State uh, release uh, about the possible interference from the Russian side and the other uh, security threats. We, we have seen that from June, number of arrests been made by uh, border security officials and some of the South and Central Asian nations, people, uh, uh, they, they've been arrested because of a strong tie with the IS, IS. So the question is regarding the election in the US. Do you have some request from 
Department of Homeland Security for the coordination specifically to counter these threats. So when it comes to election security, you know, that's something that uh, you saw the attorney general speak to. So I would refer you to DOJ and the State Department um, to really speak to how, you know, they are um, monitoring election threats and, and, and handling election security. That's just not something that DOD, um, you know, was part of that. And so I'd refer you to those two agencies to speak to that. Jared. I just wanted to check if there's any update on the, um, any clarification on this apparent strike by the Houthis on this Saudi-owned tanker, the Amjad. I know there was some conflicting information about whether or not it was hit or targeted. Or We're, I'm still tracking that, that the Amjad was hit, um, but I believe she was able to continue underway. Uh, but for more, I, you know, I'd refer you to the, the actual company. Yes, over here and then in the back. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you very much. About Syria. According to the local news reports, uh, on Monday, the PYDYPG, or in your words, SDF, released 50 ISIS members from prison. Uh, so uh, the United States always says that uh, it is partnering YPG, SDF, to counter ISIS. Uh, but in that case, the SDF, YPG, released ISIS prisoners from prison. So that's a big contradiction. So what is the reaction by Department of Defense on this matter? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure if there was a confusion in some of the facts, but if you're referring to what happened a few days ago, uh, there was, what I understand, um, uh, a breakout from one of the prisons, and we worked with the SDF to actually get those ISIS militants back in, in custody. So um, Central Command put out a press release on that. I'd refer you to that. Yes, in the back, and then last question. Did you not have a question? Never. I thought you did. I'm sorry. If you did not, then never. Okay. So thanks, Sabrina. Yeah. Uh, this uh, six million pounds of uh, humanitarian aid that uh, Trinity transported to the uh, port of Ashdod, uh, were there uh, originally planned to be transported through the um, uh, JLAC project? Um, if I'm rem remembering correctly, this was some of the aid that when um, uh, the JLOTS mission had concluded this was some of the original uh, or remaining aid that was still in Cyprus that was loaded on to the Cape Trinity and was waiting to be downloaded in Ashdod at the appropriate time that they were able to do it. Um, so this was not aid that I was tracking that was supposed to go over JLOTS. This was already um, being moved to go through the Ashdod corridor. So since they are coming from Cyprus, I assume mm -hmm. that they already went through the security check uh, right. Will they need another additional security check in Israel or there will be transferred faster than the rest of the aid? So we've been transferring aid through Ashdod um, for a bit of time, you might remember. So there's a uh, once it is checked at Cyprus, it can move through Ashdod pretty quickly. All right. Thanks, everyone.